Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn in them to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, as we continue to make our way through the book of Revelation in this summer study, this Wednesday, we're doing our verse-by-verse uh, study in the book of Revelation, and we'll be covering chapters 10 through 12, but on Sundays, we've been zeroing in and focusing in on some of these pictures that we have of Jesus in the book of Revelation. The title of the message today is The Blood of the Lamb. And the big idea is this, that the devil is real, our battle is real, but through Jesus, we can be overcomers. So let's read beginning here in verse 7. And war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you so much for that opportunity that we just had to worship you in song and to lift up our voices and our hands in honor of you. And Lord, we wanna continue to worship you as we study your word. And we pray, God, that your word would just have its way in our hearts today, that it would have its way in our lives, that you would give us insight and understanding and also application as to the passage we're gonna be looking at today. And God, I pray for anybody here in this room or anybody watching online who is not living in a relationship with Jesus right now, that, Lord, today would be the day, as you say, today is the day of salvation. So we give you this time now, in Jesus' name, amen. So this crusty old guy was living in the countryside outside of New York City, and he suddenly died. And he doesn't go to heaven, he goes to the other place. And he ends up there in hell, and the devil wants to make this guy really, really miserable. And so he gives him this horrible job of breaking up rocks with a sledgehammer. And, and the devil turns up the, the heat, and he turns up the humidity. And after a couple of weeks, he comes to check on this guy, and he finds the guy in a good mood. And he's singing, and the devil's like, why are you singing? You've got the hardest job, you know, here in hell. And, and, and it's so hot and humid. And this guy goes, well, it kind of reminds me of summers in New York, you know, hot and humid. And so I kind of feel like I'm at home, you know. So the devil decides to try another tactic. And he decided to change the weather and made it, it was really rainy and, and a lot of wind to that hellish place. And after a couple of weeks, he goes to check on the guy again, and the guy's singing again, and he's like, you know, why are you singing? And as he's breaking up the rocks, and, and the guy says, well, you know, the weather right now, it kind of rem reminds me of April and May in New York. You know, it's rainy, and, and, and this is kind of what it was like on, on the property I had as I would work on it, and so this is, I kind of feel like I'm at home. And so then the devil decides that, He's going to really, really turn things up, and he decides that he, in a last-ditch ditch effort to make this man miserable, is he lowers the temperatures of hell to sub-zero. 
And after a couple of weeks, he goes back to check on this man. And not only is he singing, but now he's dancing and he's swinging his sledgehammer all around. And and the devil's like, what's wrong with you? It's snow and ice and sub-zero temperatures. And the man from New York says with a big smile, hell has frozen over. (laughs) And that can only mean one thing. The Jets have won the Super Bowl. (laughs) Now, that crazy little story is to make an illustration that many people have misconceptions when it comes to the devil. For instance, some people just believe that he's not real, that he is just um, the, a fictional character used in silly stories or jokes like the one I just mentioned. And others have this misconception that the devil is just this picture, this symbol of evil. You know, the guy in the red suit and the, the pitchfork and the, the little tail. But another misconception that people have is that if the devil is real, that he's hanging out in hell waiting to torment people who end up there. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, would it shock you to know that the devil is not in hell? Would it further shock you to know that the devil has never been to hell and he won't go to hell until the end of the tribulation period? And when he gets to hell, he's not going to be the chief tormentor, but he's going to be the chief target. In fact, listen, it'll be on the screen to what Revelation 20 verse 10 says about the devil. At the end of the tribulation, it says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever." That's the fate that awaits him after the thousand-year reign of Christ and after he's banished into that place. And as Bible-believing Christians, we come to understand by reading our Bibles that the devil right now has a certain amount of freedom and access here on planet Earth, but also to heaven. In fact, remember in the book of Job... We read there in the book of Job that one day it says the angels came to present themselves before God and Satan came with them and the Lord said to Satan, hey, where have you been? And he says, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth, walking back and forth on it and Satan has been on the earth and now he's appearing before God and he's kind of asked to give an, an account for his actions. So we see that he's in joys, access both on earth, but also into heaven. And that's what we see here in Revelation chapter 12, verse seven. Satan is in heaven. And Revelation chapter 12 is what is called a parenthetical chapter in the book of, or or the narrative of the book of Revelation. And when you hear the word parenthetical, think of parentheses, because the Lord, what's happening here is he's pausing in the narrative. There's several of these parenthetical chapters in the book of Revelation where God is pausing in the narrative of the story of the book of Revelation to give us some further insight and detail into what is happening. And you've, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, you know that, that we have been, been seeing, viewing these horrific things happening on planet Earth as the seal judgments have been unleashed in chapter six. And then this past week, we looked at the trumpet judgments in chapters eight and nine. But then we come this week to chapters 10 through 12 where we have this pause in the story and the Lord is going to give us some details into what's happening behind the scenes. And we're gonna look at chapters 10 through 12 in its entirety this Wednesday night. But today I wanna zero in on this scene that is taking place in heaven. And as we look at this passage today, the first thing that I want us to see and notice are some things about our enemy, the devil. You know, the Bible tells us that we're not to be ignorant of the schemes of the devil, that it's important that we understand how he operates. And here's the first notable character trait about Satan that we see in the passage before us today, and it's this, that Satan is persistent. Watch this. Verse seven is kind of a shocker. It says, and war broke out in heaven. 
War in heaven? Now, when you think about heaven, I don't think anybody thinks of heaven as being a war zone, do we? No, we think of it as being a worship zone. We think of it as this place where, where people are worshiping and angels are worshiping and the glory of God and the joy of the Lord is present. But John, in, in a symbolic form, is looking at what's next in the future. And what he sees here is this war in heaven. And something else that's a shocker is that this is not referring to a past War. This is referring, referring to a future war. This is not in reference to a, a past war that, 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 the, that the prophet Ezekiel writes about in Ezekiel chapter 28. I'm going to read this to you. It's very long, but I want you just to, to, to picture this in your mind. This is what the Lord said when, when Satan was cast out of heaven. He says, you were an anointed guardian cherub, for I appointed you. From the day that you were created, you were blameless in your ways until wickedness was found in you. You were filled with violence and you sinned, and so I expelled you in disgrace from the mountain of God and banished you, guardian cherub. Your heart became proud because of your beauty, and for the, the, the sake of your splendor, you corrupted your wisdom." And so I threw you to the ground and made you a spectacle before kings. Isaiah also writes of that, that time when Satan was cast out of heaven. In Isaiah 14, again, I'll read this to you. He says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. And there he was seeing to exalt himself above God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. And so God says, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the one who made the earth tremble and who shook the kingdoms? Now what we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 12 is not a repeat of those accounts of Satan being thrown out of heaven. This is a future war with the same results. Look at verse 7 again. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Which leads me to make an obvious point. Satan finds it really, really hard to give up. He's persistent. I mean, he's lost the battle in the past. Why would he think that he could bring another coup in the future? The reason is because Satan is persistent. He finds it really, really hard to give up. He knows that he's going down. He knows that he's fighting a losing battle. He knows that, but he wants to create as much chaos and havoc and bring as many people down with him as he possibly can. It's like if this ever happened to you, you have friends that are trying to you know, throw you in the swimming pool, and what do you do? You grab on to as many of them as you can so that they can, you can pull them in with you, right? That's what he's doing. Satan finds it really, really hard to give up. You know, Jesus experienced the persistence of Satan. We read in the gospel accounts how the Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. And in that 40-day period, there were three different attempts that Satan brings in seeking to tempt Jesus, and Jesus resisted each advance and tactic of the devil. And so the devil was defeated in that battle in the wilderness. But then we read this in Luke chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. You catch that? Things like, I'm not done yet. He departed for a more opportune time. Peter said that Satan is like a roaring lion roaming around seeking whom he may devour. What's that a picture of? That's a lion. If you've ever watched, you know, National Geographic or something, you know, it's the lion stalking its prey, just looking and waiting for the right time to 
to uh, pounce. That's what Satan does. He's like a ro- roaming lion waiting to pounce. So he's persistent. And so here's John. He sees this war in heaven. It's a war that is yet future. And I want you to notice, though, that this battle is specific. It's against Michael and his angels. Do you see that? Michael and his angels are fighting against the dragon and his angels. And I hope you find a little bit of comfort in that, that the battle is between angels. It's not between God and the devil. And I think one of the biggest lies that Satan tries to perpetuate is that that he, the devil, is the opposite of God, and he's not. You know, we can sometimes have this this concept floating around in our minds that, that there's this battle between God and Satan. And we hear the you know, announcer, like the boxing announcer, and in this corner, in the white trunks is God, and in this corner, in the black trunks is, is the devil, and we are waiting to see you know, who's going to win. Nothing could be further from the truth. You see, here's the truth. God doesn't fight, he just wins. He doesn't fight. And the idea of, of Satan you know, in combat with God would be like your third grader going up against Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, you know? I mean, like, who's gonna win? I mean, come on, it's like, it's kind of ridiculous. So this is a battle against Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels. And by the way, this isn't the first time that they have squared off. We read in Jude verse nine that Michael the archangel contended with the devil over the body of Moses when Moses died. We read in the book of Daniel that when Daniel prayed, God immediately dispatched an angel to come and bring him an answer to his prayer, but the devil hindered that angel from coming until Michael, the archangel, comes along and was able to break that angel free with his answer. And you know what, guys? I think if we could peel back the sky and get a glimpse into the the spiritual realm, we would see that there is a battle going on between angels and demons that would just blow our minds. So the first thing we see here is that the devil is persistent. But let's look a little bit further. Look in verse 9 and 10. We discover something else about Satan, that he is perverse. Look at verse 9 again. So the great dragon, he's described as, was cast out. That serpent of old, the devil, and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10, and, when I, and then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren and who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. I want you to notice here that there are several names and descriptions given to the devil in these two verses that are kind of stacked up. Notice them. He's called the dragon. Do you know that, that the book of Revelation is the only book that calls Satan the dragon? But he's referred to that 13 times in the book of Revelation. He's referred to as a dragon. Why is that? Because that will be his character that is revealed in the end times, that he is a fierce tyrant, a dragon bringing destruction upon planet Earth. He's also referred to here as the serpent of old. And this is taking us back into Genesis chapter three and speaking of when he came and cunningly and subtly and craftedly but treacherously deceived Eve to eat of that forbidden fruit. He's also given the most common name that we know him by, which is the devil. It's a word or a name that means slander. You might say gossiper or one who defames another. It's Diablos in the Greek. And he's also called in this passage Satan, which means enemy or adversary. And so you put all of those names together, and here's what you have, kind of this composite description of the devil, that he is a fierce tyrant who is very, very subtle and very, very crafty, who slanders and defames, and he is your enemy. 
But that last phrase should make you happy. And I'm really serious about it. It should make you happy that that your relationship with the devil is, is one of he's your enemy. He's not your friend. And it's important that we understand that. He is not your friend. It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon who wrote this. There is something very comforting in the thought that the devil is an adversary. I would sooner have him for an adversary than for a friend. But notice also in that little passage that we just read, it says that he goes out and deceives the whole world. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. Satan is the world's pastor. He shepherds the flock of this world. And he does so seeking to bring about any type of deception that it takes to get people to not think about spiritual things, to not think about their sin or to think about the salvation that they need that has been provided by Jesus Christ. He deceives and distracts from that and makes mockery of that like we saw at the Olympics this past week. What a travesty that was. But also notice in verse 10 that he's called the accuser of the brethren. Now think about this. Satan has both access to earth, but also to heaven. And when he goes into heaven, he goes in to accuse us before God. And notice it says that he does that day and night. And he comes before God, spewing these accusations against us. And I'm sure... If you're like me, you've heard some of those accusations swirling around in your mind and swirling around in your heart. Thoughts like, who do you think you are? Thoughts like, you're not a child of God. How can you call yourself a Christian? Look what you just did. Look how you just treated your wife. You don't belong here, you know, and thinking about coming to church. Or how can you pray? God, he doesn't listen to you. Or this one, you've blown it too bad this time. God is done with you. He's through with you. How many of you have heard those those accusations in your mind before? You know, Satan really is a creep. I mean, think about it. He comes to tempt us and he'll say, hey, no one will find out. Just go for it. No one will know. And then as soon as you give in to the temptation and sin, then he comes and says, how can you do that? And God, oh man, he's going to be after you. you. You'll never get away with that. He's a creep. He starts accusing us. That's what he's a master of, the accuser of the brethren. So he's persistent. He's perverse. But as we keep on reading, we find out something else about Satan, that he is pernicious. That means he's outright wicked. Notice verse 12 again. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. And I want you to notice the word wrath there means a violent outburst of rage. And why is he so wrathful? Well, he's just got expelled from heaven. And he knows there's no more access for him to heaven. Now he's just confined to planet earth. And here the world will see the outright wickedness of the devil that he is hell bent on bringing destruction and bringing his wrath upon everyone. John Phillips in his commentary said this, Satan is now like a caged lion enraged beyond words by the limitations now placed upon his freedom. He picks himself up from the dust of the earth and shakes his fist at the sky and glares around choking with fury for ways to vent his hatred and spite upon humankind. Having no more access to heaven, he now vents all of his anger to the people on planet earth and he's gonna do this through this ruler that the book of Revelation and other books of the Bible refer to as the Antichrist. And his wrath is gonna be poured out especially toward the Jewish people. And in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it tells us that the Antichrist is going to make a seven-year covenant with the people of Israel. 
This is going to usher in kind of the beginning of that seven-year period, and he's going to come on the scene in the midst of, and I, I believe it'll be after the, the rapture, the world will be in chaos with a billion people that have, have vanished, and he's going to come on the scene, and he's going to have some answers. He's going to solve some problems, and one of the problems that he's going to solve is the problem in the Middle East between the Jews and the Arabs. And he's going to find a way somehow for them to coexist on the Temple Mount. And the Jewish people, we're going to read about this this Wednesday night, are going to be able to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. And they're going to coexist for a time. But in the first three and a half years, the Antichrist will be at peace with Israel. But in the middle of that seven-year period, what happens is what Daniel refers to and Jesus refers to as the abomination of desolation, where he goes into that rebuilt temple and he's going to declare and demand that he is worshipped as God, and in that time, the Jewish people are going to reject him. And Jesus said this in Matthew 24 about that time. And when you see the abomination of desolation is spoken by the prophet Daniel, you who are in Judea, flee to the mountains and pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath day because that's a big deal for the Jewish people. All transportation shuts down. It's against the the, the Sabbath law for them to travel far. So the dragon, Satan, now confined to earth, will pour out his fury on the earth, but especially targeting the people of Israel. And there will be a wave of anti-Semitism like the world has never seen before. Satan's persistent. He's perverse. He's pernicious. He's outright wicked. He's not your friend. Jesus said, this is his MO. He's a thief and a robber who comes to kill, to rob, and destroy. That's his end game. That's what he's about. And he comes and he seeks to make war. And we need to realize this, church. Someone said this about the church in the West, that Satan has been singing us a lullaby for decades. He's been seeking to just lull us asleep to not think about, to not really see how bad things are really getting and the battle that we are in. Church, we need to wake up. But there's one more thing I want you to notice about him in, that we see here in, in our text. Yes, he's persistent. Yes, he's perverse. Yes, he's pernicious. But he's also preventable. Look at verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Here's what this is telling us, that Satan is conquerable. Now, I know that this is referring to people that are going to get saved during the tribulation time. And they're going to resist the Antichrist. They're going to resist his plan. They're going to resist his mark. And most of them will most likely die for their faith. But I think that we can also apply this to our lives and our battle right now. What do you do when you're tempted? What do you do when you're accused and hassled and you feel the pressure of the satanic force upon your life? Do you get depressed? Do you crawl up in the the fetal position? Do you want to just give up? No, that's not what we're called to do. You can overcome him. And our passage gives us three ways, three things that we can learn about how we can overcome. First, it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Remember back in the Old Testament, on the day of Passover, when the children of Israel were, were in Egypt and they were in bondage, and after the various plagues that God brought upon the nation of Egypt, and Pharaoh just refused to let the people of Israel go. And so finally God said, this is the last plague. I'm going to have my, the angel of death fly over Egypt, and every house that, that is not marked by the blood of a lamb on the doorpost, and the doorpost, the blood put on the doorpost was put in the form that would make a cross. It was prefiguring Jesus who was gonna come to be that final sacrificial lamb. And what happened? When the angel passed by, all the houses that, were, that had the blood of them were covered, and their firstborn didn't die. Well, we can do the same. 
We can apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our lives. To all of those accusations that come from Satan. When he says to you that you're not worthy, that you're not good enough, that you're not this, that you're not that, apply the blood of the Lamb. It's recognizing that every sin that you have committed and will commit has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Jesus knew what he was buying when he went to the cross. That he was buying you. That he was purchasing your redemption and not the future version of you when everything is perfect, but you now. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 4 that, that, that you were loved before the foundation of the worlds. That God knows your past. That he sees everything in your present and he sees your future. He knows everything about you, and he still calls you his child. In John 15, 14, Jesus calls you his friend. He won't quit on you. He won't give up on you. And please hear me, friend. You cannot out the grace of God. Maybe you have an abortion in your past that the devil just loves to come and, and just condemn you for. And press down upon you for it. Apply the blood of Jesus. Maybe you have rebellion in your past where you rebelled against God and the devil just loves to bring your past to you. Apply the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe you presently, recently, slipped back into some addiction. Apply the blood of Jesus Christ. Whatever the sin is that the devil is holding over your head today, apply the blood of Jesus. You do that by repenting from your sin. And the Bible says that when we confess our sin and we repent of it, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Apply the blood. It's interesting that when Jesus was hanging there on the cross, because it was the Sabbath, the, 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 the Jewish people wanted to speed up the death process, so they went to break the legs of those two criminals on both sides of the cross with Jesus. So they could no longer push up. It would mean that they would suffocate faster and die. But the Bible says when they came to, the, to Jesus, he was already dead. He had already breathed his last. He had already cried out, it is finished. So they didn't break his legs. And the Bible says not a bone of his would be broken. And I think the reason for that, it's symbolic because blood is produced in the bone marrow of the body. And so it was God's way of saying to us, there will always be a perpetual flow of blood from the Savior to pay the price for our sins so that we can forever apply the blood. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus is called our advocate. That means he's our defense attorney. And I want you to picture a courtroom scene where Satan is the prosecuting attorney and he, he lays out his case against you. He lays out all of your sins and all of your fa failures and he has a strong case. A strong case against you. You are guilty. And the more he talks, the worse it gets. The more that you're hanging your head. But then Jesus, our advocate, our defense attorney, stands up and he says, you know, everything that he just said about Rob, that's true. Rob is as guilty as sin. But I want to remind you, judge, that I already paid the price for all of those sins that Rob has committed with my blood. And John goes on to say in 1 John 2, verse 2, and he himself, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The word propitiation means satisfaction. It means that the sacrifice of Jesus satisfied the righteous requirement of God for our sins. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, he was saying that it's been paid in full. Listen, God will bless you, not because of your ability to be perfect or devoted or to read your Bible and pray 24 hours 
a day. No, he blesses you and loves you because of the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ, on your behalf. That's the power of the blood of the lamb. Spurgeon said this, nothing provokes the devil like the cross. So what do we do? We remind him of the cross. We remind him of what Jesus did for us. And so they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Notice second how they overcame him by the word of their testimony. Because of the blood of the lamb, they have a testimony. And you know what? So do you. You have a story of how you came to Christ, of what what God has done in your life and how he has changed your life. Everyone in this room has a testimony. Now, for some of you, your testimony is how God saved you out of the pit, that he took you out of the pit, out of of just the destruction that your life had become, and he set you uh, on, on the rock. He brought you out of the pit, out of the miry clay, the Bible says, and he set you upon a rock. But you know, others of you, you have a testimony as well. Your testimony isn't how Jesus saved you out of the pit, but how he saved you, listen, from the pit. That Jesus got a hold of you before you ended up there. And all you have to do is look back to that time in your life and you look back at at some of your friends or maybe some of your siblings or some of your, your cousins and you see what became of their lives. And you realize, hey, I, would, I was on that road. I was heading in that same direction. But Jesus got a hold of me before I ended up in that pit. Guys, testimonies are powerful. You know, my dad's testimony and the transformation that God did in his life held me. It held me when I was a teenager and started having doubts about God, all I had to do was look at my dad and go, you have to be real because no one else could have done what you did in his life. And then later on in my life, when when it was the things that God had done in my life that, that kept me and helped me, when I started having doubts, my own doubts about my calling and 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 that sort of thing, I couldn't deny. I couldn't deny what God had done in my life and through my life. That's the power of a testimony. And guys, I want to encourage you, share your story. I think one of the most effective ways that we can witness is ask people. You're in a coffee shop. You're you know, going to lunch with somebody at work. Say, hey, what's your story? And let them tell you their story. And just sit patiently and wait and listen. And then don't be surprised when they said, how about you? What's your story? And then you can tell them what Jesus has done in your life. There's power in a testimony. And so they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the the, the power of their testimony. And finally, how did they overcome and how do we overcome? It says that they did not love their lives to the death. The New Living Translation puts it this way. They did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Years ago, a missionary named James Calvert went to the Fiji Islands. And back then it was a very hostile, hostile region. And the captain of the ship taking these missionaries toward the Fiji Islands tried to stop Calvert and said to him, don't go to those islands. They're going to kill you. You'll be dead if you go. And James Calvert turned to the captain captain and said this, we died before we came. The apostle Paul said this about his own life in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I die daily. I die every day. I'm dying to my will. I'm dying to my flesh. It's the realization, Paul was realizing, I exist for Jesus. That's why I'm here. That's why Paul could say, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. How would you fill in that blank? For me to live is what? For Paul, it was Christ. And so to die is gain. Like Calvert, Paul could say, hey, I died before I went. And every single one of his mission trips and journeys, hey, I died before I went because I die daily. Jesus said, whoever loves his life will lose it, but whoever hates his life in this world will keep it. And I suggest to you that people who live that way are unstoppable people. Nothing can threaten. 
You see, once you know how to die, then you know how to live. Listen, there will be many people who will turn to Jesus during the tribulation time. And they will do so knowing that it probably means that they're going to die for their faith in Jesus. We, we read in the book of Revelation of an innumerable amount of people that will come to Christ during that time. And they will be an unstoppable force. But what about us today? The lines are being drawn, my friends, in the sand. That you are either a follower of Jesus, a follower of his word, or you are not. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. That there's no neutral ground when it comes to Jesus. And the choice to be for him might not mean yet in our country that we're going to be killed for our faith in Jesus Christ, but it does mean we might be hated. It does mean that we might be labeled a hate monger, a bigot. When we take a stand and say, hey, what happened this week at the Olympics was wrong, that was blasphemous, people will look down upon us, but the question is this, do we love Jesus enough that we're not afraid to die for him? Do we love Jesus enough to have our reputation killed by false accusations? Do we love Jesus enough to have friendships die because people will forsake us and call us fanatical for following Jesus? That's how we overcome. And to be an overcomer is to embrace our calling to endure the brokenness of this world and let others know that there is a way out, that God has made a way for life and his name is Jesus. So they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb. They overcame the devil. They overcame the system of this world by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and not being afraid to die for what they believed. And what they believed that they were convinced that Jesus had died on the cross to pay the price for their sins. They were convinced that three days later, Jesus rose again from the dead and that he was alive. And they were convinced that Jesus was coming back again to rule and reign on planet Earth. And they wanted to be a part of, of that. What about us?